Elizabeth Gosuera's lecture on Wilfredo Lamb. I think what would be um, probably the easiest is if I give you a little bit of an overview. Uh, I'm going to step away and I don't know if I can um, with this mic, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of Wilfredo Lamb's work because he's a very complicated uh, sort of a, uh, a person in that he lived from 1902 to 1982. So basically he covered the entire 20th century and seemed to be involved in almost every literary and aesthetic and political movement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview and then we're going to go in chronological and geographical order so that you can kind of place where he was in each decade of his life. So he's quite an itinerant uh, uh, fellow and he moved quite a lot. And I think that that actually makes him a more interesting figure. And so I think his work will resonate with many of you on many different levels. So let's start there. Um, I'm going to put up an image of Senor Lam so that you guys can contemplate this very interesting figure. More than ever, we throw Lam, 1902 to 1982, is today recognized as an international visionary in the artistic world. He is the most internationally renowned artist produced by Cuba. And along with Chilean Roberto Mata, Wilfredo Lam is one of the two preeminent surrealist artists from Latin America. Born in Saguala Grande, Cuba, Lam was the youngest of eight children. His mother claimed Spanish and African heritage. His father, was Chinese. Astonishingly, his father, Yan Lam, was 84 when Wilfredo Lam was born, without Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> and lived until he was 108. And that was long enough to influence his son's first 24 years. With this extraordinary lineage, Lamu developed a unique artistic vision rooted in four different continents. A contemporary consideration of Lam, therefore, requires an expansion of preconceptions, boundaries, and frontiers, and must be grounded in multiple contexts. Lam's birth date, December 8, 1902, is significant in two respects, both for the date and for the year. In the Roman Catholic religion, December 8th is observed and celebrated as the feast day of the Immaculate Conception. For Lam's parents, the importance of the Catholic religion and its customs was a direct nod to his mother's Spanish roots. This was reflected in the given names of their son, Wilfredo Oscar de la Concepcion. So later when he was in Spain in 1924, Lam uh, drops the L from Wilfredo and becomes simply Wilfredo. So some of you may have wondered why he was missing his L uh, in the name of Wilfredo, but it's basically because it was easier in Spain, they just pronounce it Wilfredo. Additionally, his surnames followed the naming traditions common to his mother's Spanish ancestry of including both the paternal and the maternal surnames, Lam y Castilla. So his whole name would be Wilfredo Oscar de la Concepción Lam y Castilla. Quite a mouthful. The year of his birth, 1902, marked the date of Cuban independence from Spain, a date that presaged Lam's own independence from strictly defined aesthetic categories. At the age of 21, Lam left Cuba for Spain. As a young man, Wilfredo reconnected with his Spanish roots. During a 15-year sojourn in that country, that indelibly influenced his artistic development in the Surrealist movement. Close to the conclusion of the Spanish Civil War in 1938, Lam left Spain for Paris. There, he met Pablo Picasso, with whom he developed a close and lasting artistic relationship. The three-year Parisian period launched a fertile time of exploration into African and Surrealist motifs. The Second World War cut short his time in Paris, forcing a return to Cuba, his native land. 
It is during this 10-year Cuban period, arguably his most prolific and artistically rich decade, that Lam's surrealist roots evolved to culminate in his characteristic hybrid style, evidencing a synthesis of human, animal, and vegetal forms. Lam would spend the next three decades as an artist dividing his time between Cuba and Europe. His entanglements in the major literary, artistic, and political movements that later came to define the 20th century would leave him searching for an artistic identity. As a result, he would chafe under imposed artistic strictures and move towards a universal poetry of forms and symbols. In the midst of geographic and cultural displacements, Lam would remain focused on forging his own artistic revolution. The exhibition at the High Museum of Art includes more than 40 paintings, along with the strong representation of drawings and etchings and demonstrates that Lam was a global figure. Previous studies of Lam's oeuvre have assumed that artistic and literary movements in France and Italy most profoundly affected his work. The exhibition highlights, highlights the artist's heretofore underappreciated Spanish influences, undertaking serious research into the Spanish artistic and literary contributions to Lam's style as well to this, as to the study of his earliest paintings. So this is an important part that I wanted to bring out in the exhibit, and I think you'll see that when you go up in the first gallery, it's really devoted to the um, time that he spent in Spain. So most people tend to consider Lam uh, really beginning in his Paris period. Why? Because he meets Pablo Picasso, because Picasso promotes his work. So they think that, voila, you know, he just starts painting beautifully in 1938. But he had actually been painting in Cuba, and he had spent 15 years in Spain at the Prado, at the major museums. So he was uh, well-schooled with the Surrealists at that point. So these earliest paintings evidence the first seeds of the fledgling Surrealist movement with which he is internationally identified today. And this is a, um, a shot that we got uh, week and I was very perplexed as to why in February we had such green grass because we had Siberia and um, I just actually heard that this grass had been painted because they were doing a, a movie shoot and so they wanted to make sure it looked identical to the summer so I thank you Atlanta for your for your wonderful uh, ways in which you lift our spirits um, all right so let's move on to his Spanish period the exhibition opens with 11 paintings in Span from Lam's Spanish period, 1923 to 1938. This is a really fabulous shot of Lam. Um, and as you look in the background, you can see La Puerta de Alcalá in Madrid, which is actually a very emblematic uh, monument, which is right across from the Parque Retiro. So if you've ever been to Madrid, I'm sure you know where this is. And of course, here he is. He's just a mere boy of 21 but already looking quite dashing and handsome and a little bit of a dandy, I might even say. Uh, and so he kind of used that uh, to his advantage with the women in Spain. Um, so uh, we will open up with some of his paintings. The first one here is Plaza de Segovia from Madrid, 1923. So he had just arrived. This is painted and dated uh, 1923. We know that he arrived onto the peninsula um, in that year, in the fall of that year. So we know he painted this in the first three months that he had actually arrived. So this is a wonderful barometer, if you will, to kind of see how he was painting before he arrived in Spain or when he just arrived in Spain. And we'll look at some others and contrast what happens to him when he's uh, in Spain for a few years. This is another fabulous painting, Bodegón Dos from 1927. Um, as I mentioned, he was uh, exposed to the Prado Museum. Uh, his, his mentor and professor, uh, Alvarez Sote Mayor, was actually the director of the Prado Museum. And so Lam recounts in his biography how he would escape to the Prado and spend a lot of time studying these beautiful Baroque paintings for which Spain is known so famously, Zugaran, and Alonso Cano and one, uh, all those greats. This is a uh, Sin Titulo from 1928. 
from 1931. These are all paintings which reflect classic academic themes, especially in architecture and portraiture. It was through portrait painting, such as this one, that the young Lam was able to supplement his meager scholarship monies and eventually scrape together a less than sufficient income. However, Lam's strong association with the Spanish avant-garde movement and its luminaries, later producing some of the strongest surrealists, such as Salvador Dali, Juan Miró, and Luis Buñuel, had a direct impact on Lam's surrealist artistic de development, as is evidenced in the following paintings. Casas Colgadas Tres from 1927. So if you compare this to the first landscape that I, or cityscape that I put up, you can see that he has vastly changed in four years, his style. Uh, and this is very surrealist in tone, very oniric. Uh, and then we also have the Composition Uno from 1930. Again, we have in the foreground, we have this woman who's uh, heavily painted here, very erotic, sensual figure with her head thrown back, possibly a prostitute. And interestingly enough, in the back, we have these two sailor-like figures. This one seems to be emitting an Edvard Munch kind of angst uh, scream, el grito. And uh, then you have these stairs that actually lead to nowhere and a lone figure. So that whole idea of surrealism and of being alienated uh, and, and kind of uh, here, the background where we have the water and the moon, which is very oniric and dreamlike quality. So this would be a very sensual, kind of positive, um, surrealist uh, painting. And we would compare it then with Composition II from 1931, painted just one year later, which is instead of that kind of pleasant, dreamy quality, this is a kind of more of a nightmarish quality. You see again the women in the foreground and this woman, instead of having the maternal, uh, excuse me, the kind of erotic role of uh, femininity, she's shown here in her more maternal role as mother and child, only the child has the eyes closed, the mother looks like she's got deep circles, this one too, horrific if you will. And we know in 1931 that Lan had married uh, in 1930, Eva Perez, who happens to, she was Spanish, and they had a child, Wilfredo, and they both died of tuberculosis in 1931. So in his biography, he writes about being traumatized by the death first of his wife in 1931, and then by the child. And, and certainly one of the signs of tuberculosis is kind of a green pallor in the face. So um, there's all kinds of nightmarish scenes of abuse going on, head being uh, decapitated here, and blood running over the sides of the building. So people uh, running with their heads up, hands up, and uh, hear bats, which uh, kind of presage uh, a lot of iconography that uh, we will see in some of Lam's later paintings. So this is an important painting um, and definitely surrealist in tone. While still in Spain, Lam was exposed to the art of both Matisse and Picasso, Lam began to explore the former's influences in some of his own works, such as La Vanicana Uno, very Matissean with this background, Composition and Saint Titre from 1937. This is a double sided painting that you can see in the galleries. Um, and on both sides, Lam didn't have a whole lot of money at this time. Remember, 1937 was uh, the time of the Spanish Civil War, so he was painting, but he didn't have a lot of money, so he painted on both sides. Um, and then this one, El Retrato de la Señora García de Castro II. 1937. This is uh, one of my favorite because uh, her uh, given name was Baldina Barrera and I spent some time in the archives in Paris uh, reading the correspondence between uh, Senora Garcia, as you would uh, possibly know, Senora is the Spanish title for Mrs. so she was married um, and the letters start out uh, with Lam in correspondence to both Mr. and Mrs. Garcia 
um, uh, or Mr. and Mrs. Castro, and then uh, slowly it goes to Mrs. Castro, and then finally it evolves to Balbina Barrera, and by the end of my archival, we know that he had a full-blown liaison with uh, Mrs. Castro, um, and so uh, she's really responsible for keeping him alive during the Spanish Civil and um, it was kind of a tragic love affair because he wanted, of course, to go uh, to Paris and he wanted Balbina to go with him and he invited her to come. Uh, she appeared on the uh, train platform with her seven children in tow, to which <laughs> he said, I can barely feed myself, let alone uh, seven or eight more mouths. So she's reputed to have ripped the earrings out of her ears and uh, press them into his hand as he made his way off to Paris. So this is a, uh, she's looking quite melancholy actually too. So um, she probably knows what's waiting for her. Uh, so um, in 1936, a traveling show of works by Picasso came to Spain and it was in Madrid that Lam first viewed this artist's work. Lam reported having felt an immediate affinity for Picasso and his painting, which he described as, quote, exaltation, end quote. Undoubtedly, the apex of Lam's production during the Spanish period is in his masterpiece, La Guerra Civil, from 1937, Lam's personal homage to the Republicans' tragic attempt to defeat General Franco's nationalist forces. Like Picasso's Guernica from 1937, painted after Franco invited German and Italian forces to bomb, to bomb the northern Spanish Basque town of Guernica, Lam's Guerra Civil paints his own heart-wrenching commentary on the vagaries of war. Like Picasso, Lam was invited to quote, do a painting on the theme of war, end quote. And both masterpieces were painted for the Spanish pavilion of the World Fair in Paris in 1937. After working in the Ministry of Propaganda during the Spanish Civil War, and this is Lam here, he doesn't look like he's suffering too much, but he's looking dapper once again. Uh, but he did uh, participate and fight on the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War. And after he was um, working in the Ministry of Propaganda, he was hospitalized outside of Barcelona with symptoms of overwork and malnutrition. And when I show you the slide of Lam in Paris, when he arrives in Paris a few months later after this is taken, you can see that he's uh, got a waistline of about two inches. Um, so he was definitely malnourished. While convalescing, Lam designed sets for a theater production at the hospital. A fellow patient, the sculptor, Manuel, or Manuel Uguay, discovered Lam's work and enthusiastically provided a letter of introduction to a fellow Spaniard, Pablo Picasso, now living in Paris, France. In 1938, Lam left Spain and the war for a new promising future in a country as yet untouched by war. He was 35. In the next section, five of Lam's finest paintings from his French surrealist period 1938 to 1941. Here's his waistline that I'm envious about, um, but I don't uh, envy how he got it. So this is actually one of the paintings that Mon meant to us and is in our galleries upstairs. And um, there's another one that's very similar to this one as well. Uh, and all these paintings reveal nascent iconography that Lam develops later in his Cuban period. So this is something that's really interesting for us as scholars and spectators, students, is to look at the development of his work and look at how these influence eventually culminated in what we know as his characteristic style. The French period clearly shows the influence of Picasso's work and Lam's subsequent experimentation with African themes. Note the geometrical shapes superimposed onto African mask-like two-dimensional faces in the works of La Rigaud du Modelé from 1938, Mère et Enfant 2 from 1939, Femme, this is, this is the one that I pointed out before, Femme from 1939, and Sans Titre from 1940. 
So one of the things that I think is interesting to look at here is uh, this is very mask-like, African mask-like, and there's a wonderful collection here at the High African Collection. So um, if anybody is interested, I would certainly encourage you to go down and, and look at that. They have a stunning uh, uh, collection downstairs. And you can see the influences that uh, Ilam is picking up from the African masks. Um, here, there's no, there are no facial features, it's a blank face, but we can tell that this idea of primitivism is picked up in the color of the skin, the hair, and also some of these kind of horizontal lines in the background, which are uh, reminiscent of African textiles. And here, this is very almost Gauguin-like um, in terms of the, the hair, which is very um, uh, primitive in terms of just straight and falling down and dark, a beautiful flower in the hair. And then this one, I really uh, think that this is key to Lam's development because we begin to see how he fuses uh, this aviary creature, this bird-like creature, and clutches it in the hands and the tails and the feathers from this creature seem to fuse with this kind of Western style hair. So we have the non-Western face, the Western hair, and he begins to approximate this hybridity that I was talking about. At Picasso Lam's first formal meeting, Picasso is known to have famously quipped, you remind me of someone that I knew many years ago, me. <laughs> of the relationship, Lam described the influence that Picasso had on his work, stating, quote, I had done my own painting in a synthetic style, in an attempt to simplify my forms, before discovering Picasso's. Our artistic interpretations simply coincided. I already knew the Spanish temperament, for I had lived it, suffered it in the country itself. Rather than an influence, we might call it a pervasion of the spirit. There was no question of imitation, but Picasso may easily have been present in my spirit, for nothing in him was alien or strange to me. Indeed, in a recent interview with Esquil Lam, Alfredo Lam's son and trustee of the estate, Mr. Lam reflected on the lifelong relationship between these two great artists and suggested that the greatest effect that Picasso had on his father was to empower Lam's work. Picasso's tacit approval allowed Wifredo Lam the freedom to develop his own style and propel him forward with confidence into the world of the French Surrealists. Indeed, Lam's first exhibition in Paris was with Picasso at the Pierre Lowe Gallery in 1939. Lam's involvement with André Breton and the other Surrealists created an equally strong thematic development in his work. It was in the Chateau de Belair in Marseille, France, at the last Surrealist gathering before the outbreak of World War II, with Max Ernst, Peggy Guggenheim, André Breton, Victor Bernau, Oscar Dominguez, André Masson, and Victor Serge, among many others, and that list can go on, it's like 350, so I won't uh, bore you, but it's a fascinating read. If anybody is interested in reading, it's the story of the American Emergency Rescue Committee, so I highly recommend that. And it was there that the fusion of the surrealist elements and the African motifs came to fruition in the sketchbooks of Lam. These inchoate themes would form the seedbed for the style that would be cultivated in what is considered Lam's most important period, his return to Cuba. The third section of the exhibition encompasses the Cuban period, 1941 to 1951. In 1941, Lam was forced once again to flee, this time to flee France, France and to return to his homeland of Cuba via Martinique, where he met and developed a lifelong relationship with the influential Martinican poet Aimé Césaire. 1942 marks Lam's first full year in Cuba and proclaims a whole new direction in his paintings, as is evidenced in the works La Réunion and Anamou. These are both from 1942. In the former, La Réunion, we see elements still reflective of Lam's experience in Europe. So 
as we kind of dissect this painting a little bit, you can see the primitive elements here that Lam was certainly displaying in the late 30s in Paris. You can see surrealism with the fusion, that kind of fusion between the animal and the human as we look at the paws and the feet, the feet, <laughs> excuse me. And then also you can see kind of cubist elements that he was exposed to, Matissean compositions and kind of floral patterning. So he was very much in this painting tied to his experience in Europe. We look at this one, Anamu, 1942, painted the exact same year, we see something completely different. Uh, we still see the same kind of uh, primitivism in terms of the African mass, but instead what we're seeing is the fusion between the uh, humans, so we see that in the breasts and the buttocks, and the feet, but also we see the tail coming down, so that's the fusion with the animal, and he adds a third element, which is uh, the vegetal. So we see leaves attached to the end of the tail, and we also see this leaf-like uh, protrusion coming off the head, so it becomes part of the head, as opposed to in the other painting that was in the background. So um, in Anamu, we see his first attempts to resolve his European experience in light of his return to Cuba. New motifs in the form of rich vegetation synthesize easily with animal and human hybridity to herald an emerging yet distinctive iconography. And I love the way that he kind of leaves, as we would say in Spanish, inacabado, unfinished. It's kind of like his first tentative strokes, his own uh, lexicon which is coming through, and you can see that in a visual way. Um, so, these works demonstrate how Lam's surrealist roots evolved to culminate in his characteristic style. Foremost among the paintings is La Jungla. This painting is an extraordinary example of the culmination of Lam's hybrid style and is widely regarded as one of the quintessential masterpieces of that rich decade, along with El Presente Eterno. Lam provides a description of the later of the latter painting. Quote, the figure on the left is a whore. From her heart comes an animal's paw. She evokes crossbreeding, the degradation of the race. The figure on the right has a knife, but he makes no use of it. He does not fight. He suggests the indecision of the mulatto who does not know where to go or what to do. Close examination of these two masterpieces lends itself to various political and social interpretations, more metaphorical than literal. Indeed, Lam pointed out that the title of La Jungla, or the jungle, quote, has nothing to do with the real countryside of Cuba, where there is no jungle, but woods, hills, and open country. And the background of the picture is a sugar cane, sugar cane plantation. The Cuban writer and art critic Gerardo Mosquera averts, quote, there is no precise symbolism in La. His references to Afro-Cuban religious cultural complexes are very indirect. Mosquera goes on to opine, quote, La was only trying to transmit through the topological medium of modern art, a cosmic vision conditioned by the living African factors in his culture of origin and a general mystical sense that emanates from it. The exhibition juxtaposes many of Lam's greatest known works from that decade, such as Le Centre, Malimo, Dieu de Cafour from 1943, Oya, I love this one, and of course, uh, obviously the, the High Museum does too, because this is the uh, emblematic figure that's hanging off the front of the facade of the Richard Meyer building. Uh, Oya from 1940, oops, excuse me, much more reduced palette, much more Baroque, black and white, a lot of movement. Um, and then we see the syncretism, which is followed by these 
deities, these uh, African Cuban deities. This one is Elewa, it has the little horns there. And we also see, um, or I used to see, here's Ogun, which is the god of metal, the god of war. So it's a synthesis also of these spiritual religions, the Roman Catholic religion and the West African Yoruba religion. Uh, and then, oh, this is another one of my favorites, Au Défaut du Jour from 1945. Again, a really reduced palette. Um, and it's a really sublime painting. My, this photograph doesn't do it justice, so um, please make sure you take a look at it up in the galleries. Inspired by Jan's trip to Haiti in 1946, elements of voodoo, santeria, and syncretism are reflected in many of his works over the duration of the Cuban period. One such recurrent motif is the horse-headed woman, also commonly referred to as femme cheval or mujer caballo, and exemplified in the work entitled Femme Cheval from 1948. According to scholar and art critic Julia Hertzberg, the horse-headed woman is a hybrid whose human, horse, and vegetal features combine to suggest a spiritual union between the devotee and the deity. So in Santeria, in the religion of Santeria, when one is about to become uh, a priest or a priestess, they uh, go through a ceremony in which uh, the inductee uh, will have the saint, the deity, will come and rest on the head and ride the devotee as if he or she were a horse. So that is the kind of uh, explanation for the Mujer de Caballo. By the late 1940s, the signature-like motif was recognizable by emphasizing the replacement of the human head with an eclectic array, so here, and this is almost like, uh, these horns are representative, representative of El Roi, the deity, uh, that opens and closes the doors to the future. So you want to make sure that you pray to him uh, to make sure that things go the way you want them to go. He's a very picaresque, mischievous fellow, so you don't want to um, uh, alienate him. So you, here he is again, right here. So he's always kind of exempt. Here he is hanging upside down because he's a little trickster. Um, so you want to make sure that you uh, keep him in your back pocket. Uh, and so he would completely change the heads, substituting them for Eloise, fish, diamonds, horns, phalluses, or fragments of mouths derived from Lam's Afro-Cuban background. These motifs would be reworked throughout his practice to symbolize different meanings during the evolution of his work. Many of these great paintings were purchased in Cuba by some of the visionaries of the museum world, such as the Museum of Modern Arts Alfred Barr Jr. and Murata School of Design Museum's Daniel Robbins. Acquired over the last five decades, these parent paintings have rarely, if ever, been exhibited together. Commitments for loans of outstanding painting from additional lenders in New York City, Miami, Chicago, Houston, Paris, and Zurich ensure that the exhibition provides a representative and original view of Lam's last period. 1952 to 1982. Living and working in Cuba and Europe and spending long stretches of time in the U.S., Lam eventually settled in France and Italy. The exhibition demonstrates how in this final period, Lam's style evolved from a lexicon of hybridity reflected in a re revolution of ideas and forms in the 40s to a more abstract reading in the 50s evidenced in Son Titre, Cruz, from 1958. Now, of course, he, in, by this time, in the late 40s and in the 50s, he had traveled frequently to New York and had met some of the great precursors to the abstract expressionist movement, such as Roberto Mata, Robert Motherwell, and Jackson Pollock. Uh, and here we see this beautiful painting from 1959. Finally, in his later period, extending over the 60s and 70s, we see the culmination of Lam's personal iconography in the works of Gran Composition from 1960. This is one of my favorites as well. And of course, you can now tell that I have lots of favorites. Um, but you can see here that 
while he has returned to the figure because the figure is too important to Lan to let it go. It's too symbolic to him. He does uh, reincorporate the figure, but in a much more abstract framework. These, uh, and then this one is A la fin de la nuit from 1969. And then you see this kind of bat-like figure and two-headed, and he wrote a biography poem of his experience when he was five years old, when he was lying in his bed and looked up and saw a bat with two heads hanging from the ceiling. And he recounts this story as his first moment, his epiphany of really realizing at five that he was an independent being. He was probably scared to death and realized that nobody was gonna save him except for himself. So um, the bat figures in a lot of Lam's works. These works are some of the strongest paintings in the exhibition in which Wilfredo Lam demonstrates a metamorphosis of imagery that come to define his signature painting style. Visitors, students, and scholars alike have access to some of Lam's greatest masterpieces exhibited together for the first time, allowing a re-examination of the breadth of Lam's oeuvre and a reassessment of his position in 20th century art. Representing a new understanding of Wilfredo Lam as a global artist, the Highs exhibition demonstrates how Lam's unique aesthetic gives expression to multiracial and multicultural aspects of his heritage and his experience. In a personal interview, Lam told art critic and author Max Ford Fouché, quote, from childhood, there had been something in me that was leading to la jungla. My idea was to represent the spirit of the Negroes in the situation in which they were then. But according to Fouché, overt political protest was never to be Lam's style. He would rather use, quote, poetry to show the reality of acceptance and protest, end quote. Early exposure to poets and writers, Rafael Alberti, Federico García Lorca, André Breton, Aimé Césaire, Nicolas Guillén, and Alejo Carpentier eventually led to a series of collaborations with several well-known poets in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, including René Char, Alain Geoffroy, and Gabriel García Márquez. In an interview in Cuba in the late 1970s, Lam said, quote, I would have liked to have been a writer because I think the word is the most eloquent element that exists. But I don't think I have the gift of words. Nevertheless, painting can be as eloquent. We are pleased to present the eloquence of Lam 